Welcome to Advanced Legal Documents Preparation, LGLA 2333. I'm very excited that you'll be joining us in this class. Uh, so let's get started. Um, you should be looking right now at um, the uh, kind of first screen that you'll see when you go into Canvas. You probably already found this since you're watching my lecture, but um, if you somehow have gotten to my lecture through some other mechanism, um, be sure uh, when you go ahead and click on the course uh, to uh, identify this as the place that you start. So when you go into the courses through this button over here, courses button, it will take you to home. And home is where all the action is. It's, all, it's where all the modules are. You'll see that you have two other choices. Uh, you can look at your grades and you can look at announcements. But, you know, 95% of your time you're going to be on this screen. The first module we have is called Start Here Orientation. Pretty self-explanatory. Really all of the material in this first module is designed to get you set up to understand what's going on in the course. This material has really two functions. One is it's to get you kind of oriented, get the little uh, take, take on words there, and it's also designed to be a resource for you throughout the semester. Um, there's a lot of information to know uh, for this course. Um, and so sometimes you may be thinking, gosh, I've forgotten how we do the letter. You know, we will we'll do some letters at the beginning, then we'll do some letters later. And sometimes you might find that you lose a particular fact. Do I indent here? Do I not indent here? That type of thing. Um, and so some of the answers to those questions you'll find if you refer back to this material. Of course, you can always go back and look at the actual lecture for that particular subject, but that takes a little bit of time. And if you're um, wanting to conserve time, sometimes the resources in the orientation section can work. I'm gonna alert you to something that is both a good thing and a bad thing about this course. Um, and it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing for the same reason, which is kind of funny. And that is that you'll see some things in this course that are that is actually giving you bad advice. Um, uh, there's a couple of reasons why I do that. The first is that you will, in your practice, be uh, given uh, lots of different pieces of information and sometimes you have to sort through those pieces of information or selectively use information. Uh, for example, you might be working with attorney A and she prefers that you do things in this format and then you work for attorney B who prefers that you do things in a different format and so you may have to keep two systems in your head and flip between the systems. Or you might uh, be looking at document A and uh, you're supposed to use that as a model, but even though document A is super cool and really awesome in lots of respects, it does a couple of things wrong. And so obviously you're not going to pay attention to those portions. You're going to look at the parts that are helpful to you and then uh, correct or do better in those areas that are wrong. So um, that's real world. That is how your documents are gonna be. Um, most of the time when you're working from a document, it's not gonna be perfect, it, at least not perfect for the particular use you're gonna have. You're gonna have to evaluate it and say, I like this, I like this, I like this, oh, this isn't good, I'm not going to do that, but I like this, I like this, but oh, I don't like that. And so you'll see some of the examples of things. Those will be in the sample documents folder, which we'll look at in a couple seconds, and there will even be some examples that I use. So always use what I say in the lectures as your gold standard. I'm never going to steer you wrong in the lectures. But some of the things I post, it's going to be like 90% right, but there may be a few things wrong about it. And again, the reason why I do that is in part conscious, because that's the real world. You're never going to have those perfect models to work from. And I'll be honest with you, another reason is just uh, life, that there aren't perfect examples of every single format uh, that we have out there. And so sometimes uh, the ones that we use are less than perfectly uh, suited for a particular purpose. Okay, so just uh, keep a note about that information. Um, you'll notice as we go forward that from time to time I'm going to stop you and say, wait a second, um, uh, write this down in your notes or something along those lines. And of course, you'll be writing things down as I'm talking as well. If you haven't already identified a notebook or a, a loose leaf folder or whatever you use to keep your notes, go ahead and pause right now. Go find whatever resource you're going to have. It doesn't have to be pretty. doesn't have to be of any particular type. And as I'm talking, take careful notes. Stop me. Go back and listen to it again and write it down. It's a lot easier to spend maybe one and a half times the amount of time listening to the lecture once than having to listen to the lecture four times because you keep on forgetting, did she say 
tab in one or tab in two there. Um, so take careful notes and then let's say it's on a letter format we do a letter early on then we do letters later on you don't have to watch the lecture again everything that you need is in your notes so spend a little bit of time to save yourself a lot of time later on in terms of uh, completing documents as efficiently as possible um, effective note taking is really really helpful to this class this is stuff you don't know already or if you do know them, let's say you've worked as a legal secretary the last 20 years and you know more about how to create legal documents than Cynthia Groover knows. Entirely possible that you're in that situation. Well, but guess what? You don't live in my brain. I am the only one who gets the honor or whatever you want to call it of living in this brain. And there will be things that I say that aren't going to be exactly the way your firm has done it. And so you can do it exactly the way your firm does it, and it may be an awesome, magical way of doing things, and you're going to lose points because it's not the way I'm teaching in this course. We'll talk more about which ways you, you do certain tasks as we go forward and why we do it that way and what are some alternatives. We'll talk about all those things, but the important thing to keep in mind is there's not one way of doing things in life, in law, but there is one way of doing things in this class. And if you do it another way, that might be awesome and amazing. Um, in another context, it's not going to be awesome and amazing here. Okay, so let's talk about well, why, if, if there's more than one answer, why don't you let me do it in a multitude of ways? Um, a few reasons. For one thing, many firms have a policy that you have to do things a certain way. Um, when I was at Baker Botts, um, when I was starting out, all letters were signed very truly yours, comma. You could not sign it sincerely. If you were the managing partner of the law firm and you really love the expression sincerely, guess what? You weren't going to be able to sign it sincerely. It was always going to be very truly yours. You had no discretion in these matters. And why would you want discretion? It makes sense for a firm to have one way of doing it, to have almost like a branding of the firm. Um, again, Baker Botts had a certain way, a certain letter format. It's pretty similar to the one that we're going to use, but it's not identical to it. It's a rather formal, nice way of looking at a letter. But if I had worked at Fulbright, it probably would have been a little bit different. If I had worked at Vincent Nuggins, it probably would have been a little different. None of those are bad, but you know what? For Baker Botts, it would have been bad for me to use the Fulbright form. For Baker Botts, it would be bad for me to use the V&E form because that's not how they do things. If I had been at V&E and I'd used the Fulbright form, that wouldn't have been good. You have to adapt and adjust to the culture of the place where you work. And so learning one system, not that it's magical, but just know, wait a second, whatever my system is, I need to immerse myself in it and adapt to it. Another reason why I want you to learn this one system is that you want to have at least one system in your belt because there are going to be documents you produce before you go to work for a law firm, for example, your resume and your cover letter, and to have a good working system that says, I'm a professional, I know how to put documents together is important. Once you arrive at the firm, you'll learn their system, and that will be an awesome system, but you don't know their system yet, and so you need to have at least one system in your back pocket. The third thing is you may go to work for a law firm, especially a new one or a small one, that doesn't have a set way of doing all these tasks, that there's something loosey-goosey about it. And so you may be kind of that voice in the wilderness that tells everyone or at least tells yourself how you're going to go about doing this. You have some standard to apply that will make your documents for your firm look good. Now, um, if you go to work for a firm and they do documents differently, should you keep on doing things this way? Obviously not. You do things the way your boss wants you to do things, unless it's some sense unethical. I have had many paralegal students tell me, my boss does it this way. And usually what I say is do it the way your boss wants to at work and do it the way I want you to do it in um, our class. And that works out really, really well most of the time. I had one student once t tell me, though, that um, she was sharing with her boss how um, I taught to do it and the boss looked at her and goes you're right that's how we ought to be doing it and so as a result of her comments the firm changed the way it did its its particular tasks um, I'm not asking you to be a trailblazer I'm not an apostle of this style I have no trouble with other styles it's just for this class play by this set of rules assume I'm the managing partner of the law firm and this happens to be the way I like the letters okay or whatever the documents might be 
Let's go back to our orientation section and we're going to cover each one of the documents here. But of course, we start with the orientation lecture. This is what you're listening to right now. This is where you start. This is going to include lots of good information. Uh, most likely, you'll see when you're actually looking at the course that there's actually two lectures here. Usually, I break it up into two lectures. This next item just tells you what course you're in. Maybe you're taking several courses over the course of this particular semester and you might get them confused. You might accidentally click on the wrong one. You can find the name of the course up here in this section and you'll also find it here. Um, you probably know me, you've probably taken many courses with me, but if you haven't, I'm looking forward to getting to know you. This is my name, Professor Cynthia Groover. This is the PowerPoint we'll be using throughout this particular lecture. You have access to the PowerPoint. We'll, I'll open it up in a few minutes and we'll play around with it. And then this is the syllabus. Uh, probably more than any other course, except maybe legal writing, um, this syllabus is something that you really need to use on a regular basis. I'm going to suggest that you pause me now and go get your day planner or your uh, calendar on your phone or whatever you use for calendaring purposes and um, get ready because you're going to be adding some dates to it. It's really important that you calendar um, whether you're taking this during a long semester or the summer semester because this course has an insane number of deadlines and an insane number of documents. Very few of the documents are genuinely difficult um, but there's a lot of them and so you'll want to make sure that you have the dates um, marked so that you will meet the deadlines because as we'll talk about later, I don't accept late work. Here's a summary about the course. You probably already know about it if you're this far into the paralegal program, but if you're new to the program and taking this course to get started, this might be some interesting and useful information. And here's some information about me. I'll let you visit that at your leisure if you'd like to. And here's a little welcome letter. I'm going to skip down to this one though, which is the cheat sheet. This is going to go through um, what you need to do each week. And I say each week, but I really mean each module. If you're taking this course over the summer, most weeks will be doing two two modules. So it'll be double this most weeks. If you're taking this during a long semester, it will just typically be one module per week, unless of course you're working ahead because maybe you're going to be on a business trip or some other trip, or maybe you're just really busy with some other task for a particular week. You can always work ahead in my class. Um, I encourage you to do so. It kind of makes sense to have a bit of a buffer because life is stressful and people get sick and things happen. And so everybody wants a little bit of, of lead time that they can maybe uh, use in the event of a catastrophe or even a mild inconvenience. Um, I don't accept late work, but I do accept early work. And so that's a, a useful thing to keep in mind. I encourage students to be about a week ahead when you can do it. Can't always do it, but you certainly don't want to be working on these projects on the due date. That's a recipe for disaster because you and I both know technical problems come up. Uh, you get sick, kids get sick, your computer flakes out on you, um, or you get invited to do something super cool and you don't want to be doing your homework. Uh, so don't wait until that last day. Um, but um, I mean, that's your judgment call, of course. Here's what the cheat sheet looks like. And these are the things that you'll be doing for each module. The first thing I recommend you do is you read the assigned readings. Um, some are going to be in an assigned textbook and some will be in the module. You want to do this for every module. So let me go back here and let's look at what those assigned readings might be. So let's just go down here. We'll pick a, uh, uh, let's do no, module number five. You can see we're in the assigned material section. So you can see there's something about um, uh, uh, something to read in the Aspen Handbook. Um, we actually have um, two assigned textbooks. I say two, but that's kind of misleading because you really should only have one or the other. There's no reason to buy both. Uh, one I'm going to call the Aspen Handbook, or some of them is just Aspen, and some is just writing. Um, we're uh, kind of uh, uh, getting out of or slowly getting out of using the Aspen Handbook. It's a great resource, but um, the Just Writing book is a better book in our opinion and uh, Professor Wagner's in my opinion. And so we're moving from at the Aspen Handbook being kind of the curriculum wide grammar tool to having Just Writing. But um, we recognize that some students have already purchased the Aspen Handbook for another course. And so we don't want to ask that they buy the Just Writing in addition to unless of course they want to. And so you'll see um, I try to list um, 
when material is in both Aspen and Just Writing, I try to list both pages. Sometimes the information that I'm referencing is just in the Aspen handbook. There isn't something similar in Just Writing because it's a somewhat different scope of, of writing. In that case, it's more, if you have Just Writing, it's more important than ever that you listen carefully to the lecture to get the information in some of these other resources. Um, so for this particular chapter, there is no assigned reading um, other than uh, 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 these two. Let me look at another one so I can show you what an assigned reading might look like. Let me go. Well, I guess, okay, I sh I sh so some of these might be assigned readings. Um, I forgot that. I guess they all look the same. This is a video. So I guess this is maybe... Here we go. Ah, oh, yes, this is a statute. So this is um, not a video. So I guess they don't always um, look like, even though it looks like it's a video thing, um, some of these are going to be videos and some are going to be lectures. This is a, a document to look at. I don't know right off the bat this is a video or a document. But anyway, you should go through all of these and read all the material and look at this video. We'll talk more about this video in a couple of minutes. So these, when I talk about do the assigned readings, that's what I'm talking about. Let's go back to your cheat sheet. That's item number one. Then you're going to look at the instructor's keys, example documents, and videos from previously submitted assignments. Boy, this is so important. Students who aren't successful in this class can't be doing this. Um, otherwise, it'd be successful. It's just that simple. Um, if you don't do this, you aren't going to be, you're probably not going to be successful. So there are some students who get it right from the very beginning. It's okay if you're, if you're occasionally you get not the best grade. As long as you see what you did wrong and do it the correct way. Oh, I forgot to indent that. Next time I'll indent it. I now know. I mean, honestly, it's just as easy to do these assignments correctly as incorrectly. It's just easy to indent as not to indent. Let me show you when I talk about um, assignments. Since this is the beginning of the semester, I haven't turned on any answer keys, so I'm going to pull something up just quickly so you have a, the flavor of it. So this, these are things that you'll see after you've submitted assignments. Okay, so let's just look at, let's scroll down here to lecture five. So let's say that um, module five is about a letter, a FOIA request. And after the assignment is submitted, then I will turn on the comments for the FOIA request. And here, there's all of the comments listed. And you can see at, beside each comment, there's a number. So for example, number 38 said, some students did not attach their assignments. Instead, they pasted their assignment in the comments section. This practice caused them to lose their formatting. After the first assignment course, I do not grade assignments submitted in this way. Um, number six. Some students had typos. I took off only one point, no matter how many typos were present. So in your comments, in your grading section, um, you will have listed everything that caused the deduction. You'll have a number 36 there. The number 36 doesn't have any meaning unless you look at the comment code, and so you need to look at this. Now let's say you only have one comment code. You only missed one point on a particular assignment, number 36. You might think to yourself, well, all I should read is number 36. Not so. You should read all of the comments because just because you didn't get, com let's say, let's look at number uh, 14. What is 14? Some students left off the salutation resulting in a two-point deduction. Just because you remember the salutation in this assignment doesn't mean you'll remember it next time. It's a good way to remember it. And these are good to use as checklists. So the next time we have a letter assignment, go through these and say, okay, did I do this? 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 And that will help you get it right. Another reason you want to look at all the comments is that I'm pretty careful. I try to capture every single mistake, but every now and again, somebody will uh, uh, commit a certain error and I don't see it. And so I don't take off for something I don't see. Uh, but next time you do it, I probably will see it. And so if you look at the comments, you'll more likely get it correct. And then finally, another reason you want to look at all the comments is that it's kind of satisfying to see what you did that other people didn't do right. 
So that's the comment section. And now we have the, an example of a successful assignment. Um, this is how it probably should have looked. It's not the only way it can look, but this gives you an idea. This is also super helpful because if you don't know what the assignment should look like, this tells you how it should look. Let me flag this for students. Every now and again, I will have students who are international. Maybe they grew up in a different culture. Uh, different cultures have different ways of creating letters. So the, the style that you may have been exposed to in a professional level may look very different than the style we use here. The style you use in, in the, the country where you used to live may be awesome and amazing and perfect for that country. I'm not saying that, that kind, people in those, that country are doing it incorrectly. I'm saying that doesn't work here. And so if you are from a different country and, and maybe you've corresponded in that other style, you have more to learn than somebody who's grown up in the United States and seen letters in our particular format. Um, so um, keep that in mind. Most of the people who really submit letters that are just kind of out of left field, very, very different from the way they should look for the letters produced in the United States are often international students or students who've lived abroad for some period in their careers. Um, but again, it, it can happen with, with um, uh, people who've, who perhaps have lived their entire life in the United States too. Okay, so we've talked about looking at the, uh, also have videos for some assignments. Most of the time my videos are going to be the grammar assignments. We'll talk more about those later on. The next thing you want to look is you want to look at, the, so once you've done the first two things, you want to look at the document assignment that we have for this particular week. Let's just go look at a document assignment. Okay, I'm going to scroll down to, we'll look at the document assignment for number, module nine. The document assignment, again, it'll be under the assignment section. The document assignment is going to be a document, or module nine, pleadings assignment. You open it up and you'll see here's some information about the assignment and here's the actual assignment document. I'll look it over pretty carefully. I encourage you to print it out um, just so you can have a, a paper version of it as you're working on the computer, but you don't have to if you don't want to. So this is the document, the information that you need to complete this assignment. But you don't know what to do with it at this point. You shouldn't, you'd be wasting your time to launch into doing the, doc, the, the assignment until you've seen the video. The video is an essential part of completing the assignment. If you have two hours before the assignment is due, don't start working on the assignment. Watch the video. Watch the video as you do the assignment. That's the most efficient way. But you have to look at the assignment first and then start watching the video. And then as you learn a little bit about how to do it, because I will tell you, indent here, don't indent here, italicize here, don't italicize here, put this in bold, whatever the thing might be, I'm going to tell you step by step. And so you'll do it. You'll listen to what I say. You'll pause me. You'll go into Word and do it. It is a very interactive process. That's how it ought to work. That's going to be your most efficient way. You also are going to want to um, take notes because, again, this isn't the last time you're ever going to do a letter. The first time you do a letter, you want to get all that information so the next time you do a letter, you can just refer to your notes super easy. Or the first time you do a, a case caption, you want to um, know how to do it so you don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel each time and so take notes as you're working on it. Okay, so that's um, the next part of the cheat sheet. So we've talked about read the document assignment and now you're going to watch the video lectures that relate to that document assignment. So you go back and look at the video lecture for module nine. Let's go and look see where we find that. And you can see it's just called Lecture on Pleadings. Couldn't be easier than that. You'll see I also have a PowerPoint that I'll be using, and I have another lecture that talks about how to do a particular skill in that. You click on this, watch it, and as you're watching it again, pause it to work on the actual assignment. Okay, so you're going to 
complete the document assignment. If you haven't done so while you're actually watching the lecture, maybe there's a few cleanup tasks you need to do. My suggestion is once you finish with the lecture to go ahead and complete the document assignment when it's fresh in your mind. If you have to go back and look at a little bit of a video or look at your notes from a particular uh, or a previous lecture, go ahead and do that as well. Of course, if you encounter a question that, now did you say to indent two times or one time? Well, what if this happens or what if that happens or what if this is my particular situation? Groover didn't cover my particular scenario. Um, then you're going to want to post a question and there's a particular question board that I ask that you post here. Now, if it's an individual question, it's about your particular circumstances. Hey, I want to know if I can do this. I um, mean, you don't really want the whole world to know, then don't post it here. But if it's something of general interest about the assignment, then this is the right place to post where it says questions. Let me show you where to find that. Go to home. This is in the orientation board. You're going to scroll down to the bottom and it says questions. I also call it instructors pointers. You go here and you can post your question. Hit reply here and I will post my answer. And I'll also from time to time um, list uh, answers or comments or things that I think might be helpful to folks as they complete the assignments. So visit here often to find out new information. If it's something that you feel like you need a little bit more support on, maybe you don't have strong Word, um, Microsoft Word skills, and you aren't sure how you do that particular task, come to my office hours. I'm glad to help. Most of the time, it takes about three minutes for me to show you what to do. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even see that button there. Um, to, to sweat over it for several hours, to be worried about it, um, that's not a productive use of your time. So come and see me and I'll be glad to provide some support for you. Let's go back to our cheat sheet. Um, next thing is participate in the discussion board. Do you now have enough information about the assignment that you're in well positioned to actually do the discussion board? So let me show you what the discussion board looks like. I'm going to go back to home. Each module has a discussion board. You have to participate in 10 of the discussion boards. Uh, you can pick the ones that you want. The discussion boards open um, Monday morning at 12.01 a.m. and they close Sunday night 11.59 p.m. Um, so you have one week to. This is the only thing you can't work ahead on. So if you happen to be really incommunicado for a particular week, then that's one of the discussion boards you're going to miss. But it's okay that you're going to miss it because you only have to do 10. So here we go. I'm going to click into this discussion board. So you'll only, you only have if this is a long semester, typically you only have one discussion board open at a time, so it's easy to know which one to work on. Um, and again, if you see it, you know it's going to go away uh, Sunday at 11.59 p.m. If it's over the summer, you may have more than one discussion board, um, and so you want to be sure to keep track of that. The syllabus can help you with that, or you can just look to see what's available um, uh, to you uh, uh, on Canvas. So here's an example discussion board. Um, you'll see this part is what you're supposed to discuss and then the second part is a reminder about the rules of posting. I put this reminder in all discussion boards. Obviously you don't have to read it because usually it's the same thing. Um, there's a couple of times where it's a little bit different but most of the time it's the same thing. Let me just refresh you or let you know what's in this. Uh, in the discussion board, engage your classmates in stimulating discussion while uh, adjust as you would in a live lecture class. I will be monitoring the discussion board weekly for class participation. I am looking for substantive posts from each student. Posts that say more than I really enjoyed the topic. I'm looking for thought-provoking comments and from those who have taken courses in the subject that we're covering, I expect to see a more in-depth contribution. So for example, if you've taken family law, uh, when we cover the family law module, I want to hear. Well, in family law class, we talked about this, this, and this, or here's some more information about this, this, and this. That's really awesome. That's what I want to see. If you haven't taken family law yet, you can't do that. That's fine. I'm not expecting you to um, do stuff that you haven't already taken. Your substantive post must be at least 100 words in length. It can be a lot longer. It's not at all unusual for me to have a three, four, five hundred word submission. That's awesome. 100 pages is pretty much the bare minimum. Um, it's all, it's very difficult to have a really awesome post that's 100 words. Um, you need to include the word count at the end. Uh, since you're going to be using Microsoft all the time, what you can do, 
and I here, let's imagine this is my post right here what I have in yellow I'm gonna copy it I can plop it down into word here is that information and I just do a word count I go to review I go to word count and I'm told that this has 192 words so what I would do is do word count 192 and then I could cut and paste this into the discussion board and I've completed the assignment um, or I can manually count or use some other tool I'm sure there's internet uh, websites that will count these words for you for free if you don't happen to have access to word at that particular time you know I mean one service might say it's 192 words and one might say it's 190 but let's say this is all you posted I can look at that and see it's not 100 words and what I do and I'm going to be very honest here is I do cut and paste and put in a word if it seems to be that it's under 100 words um, and when you either leave out the word count or tell me a word count that doesn't can't possibly be something that you legitimately came up with that's a problem we can't have unethical behavior um, in this class I'm not going to put up with it and so don't do it um, that's not going to be a happy situation for you or for me and so keep your count correct if somehow or another you can't get to 100 words for whatever reason post the number of words you have don't leave out the word count even if it's below 100 because you're going to lose points part of the assignment is to include the word count okay uh, so uh, you must include its word count at the end. that's for the substantive post um, in your two responsive posts each must be two sentences long so here I don't need a word count although you can post it if you want to but they have to be two complete sentences long okay each week you can earn up to 10 points um, uh, so you, you'll see that that is the range um, if you um, your overall it's, it's five percent of your grade overall so when you participate for those t 10 modules that you're choosing to participate um, you know put kind of your best foot forward better to participate really really well in 10 than to participate eh, kind of sort of okay for all of the postings um, if you do poorly on one discussion board then no worries just participate in 11 because I take your 10 highest grades and so you can make up for some uh, disappointing grades let's say you do a, a strong uh, substantive post but you forget to do your reply post for a given week the weeks closed you can't fix that no worries you'll just go ahead and participate in another discussion board okay so that is the uh, the discussion board process each discussion board will have three posts keep in mind for the 10 that count you can't mix and match you can't say well I had a great a substantive post for um, module 4 and two great reply posts for module 6 I'm not going to combine them um, I'm going to look at your module 4 discussion board grade in total and your model 6 a discussion grade in total when I am calculating grades and take your 10 highest grades so that's the discussion board we met to our cheat sheet um, and then you're going to complete the grammar proofreading assignment if you have one um, usually it's the odd numbered modules that have a grammar proofreading assignment let's spend some time talking about grammar proofreading um, I said before that this course is uh, has a lot of assignments and it does and most of the assignments are pretty easy um, if though uh, grammar isn't your thing the grammar proofreading assignments are probably going to be the challenging part there's a couple things to know about the grammar proofreading assignments first of all is grammar assignments count a lot less than document assignments whenever you're doing a course you ought to consider the weight of that particular assignment in deciding how much time to spend on it I mean it doesn't make any sense to spend hours working on a discussion board and spend just a little bit of time on a document assignment because uh, the weight is just so much different than that the document assignment is worth a ton more than any single discussion board posts so think about the weight when you decide how to spend your time the grammar proofreading activities you can spend 
a lot more time than you can on the document assignments if you want to. But the actual weight of the assignment is quite a bit less. Now, it might make sense for you to spend more time on the grammar proofreading assignments because you're developing very important professional skills. But if what you're focusing on is maximizing your grade, that's not the smart strategy to do. So let's look at the um, uh, grammar proofreading assignments. One thing to keep in mind is the instructions. View this. This is a, a just a couple minute long instruction here that tells you how to go about doing it. I go through and explain to you um, the process for it. I'm not going to do that right here, but I just want to let you know where it is. And many of this, of course, is in the orientation module, so you don't have to remember which one it is. Just remember it's up here. And let's go down to a grammar proofreading assignment. So I'm going to go to the one in module one. You can see it's an odd numbered module and this is the assignment right here. You can see it's called punctuation grammar proofreading assignment. And the reason I call it grammar proofreading is that you're really doing two things. You are correcting grammar and you are proofing a document. In the document there's going to be errors that are grammatical or punctuation based and there's also just going to be good old-fashioned typos. Um, so in this particular assignment, here is the uh, a proofreading assignment. Click on it. Here it is. This is the document you're going to proof. Just two paragraphs. What I recommend that you do is go to another page. But by the way, if you don't know how to do this, the way to start a new page um, in um, Word is just to hit control enter and that will start a new page. I like to have my whole document on one page and the next thing I will do is blow up my font. I like to do 20 point uh, font. This allows me to see it super easy. Okay so this lets me get started. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can proofread. One thing is you can look for one issue all the way through. You can decide well I'm going to look for typos. Um, and what I might do is I might actually use the review button and have Word look for spelling and grammar errors. And you can see Word has already identified with this blue underline a couple of issues, this one and this one. Then there's this one and this one and this one. So Word is already going to give you some hints. Now I have programmed Word to point out certain problems. Your version of Word may not have those particular things identified. I'm glad to sit down with you and show you how to program Word. Um, if you like, just come see me and we can work together on that. But even if I'm not using Word at all, I can go through and look for particular issues. Or I can do a global work through and look through each line trying to identify problems. It's very common, this is true for me, and my guess is it's probably true for most people, is that I can look at something and I can absolutely know the rule and yet it can be staring me in the face and I don't see it. I may not see the problem that's right in front of my eyes. And that's why blowing up the font can make it easier for me to see. Another strategy is to read it aloud. Reading it aloud forces you, in some sense, to see what's really there versus what you want to see. Another strategy is to um, click on home and then go over here and hit on this backwards P, which is the paragraph sign, and it will show you all the formatting. So you can see every time there's a space bar, it's going to be a, middle, a dot in the middle. And so if for some reason there were two spaces here, let me make the space bars go away, you might not notice that there's an extra space here. It's kind of obvious, but not super obvious. But when you turn on that sign, it's super obvious. See, there's two dots there, so you'd go ahead and remove one. Um, anyway, that's how you go about approaching it. It's a good idea to look through this several times um, on several different days because you will, your brain will be kind of uh, geared into seeing a particular error. The grammar proofreading activities progress. So the first um, uh, grammar proofreading assignment is the easiest because it really is just talking about one topic. The next one will include topics from the previous lesson and the current lesson. By the end, you'll have, you know, eight or ten topics that um, can be in play. And so it becomes a much more complex thing. But you might want to just focus on 
this topic and this topic and this topic because you'll obviously know the topics that we've covered um, and also look at the key uh, from previous grammar proofreading activities if you have a hard time identifying passive voice be sure to go back and look at that lecture or to look at the passive voice a uh, grammar proofreading activity so that you can be refreshed about how to find those things if the topic is subject verb agreement but you found very few errors involving subject verb agreement be pretty darn suspicious because that doesn't make a lot of sense. Obviously, I would include several issues along those lines. So you're going to make the corrections. And again, I explain in this assignment and in this assignment how to go about making corrections. Uh, you need to play by the rules. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why I do that. First of all, um, if you don't uh, if you proofread in another way, it oftentimes creates ambiguity. Did you really mean to make this change or that change? And I try to remove as much ambiguity from these assignments as possible. There's always going to be some, I know that. Uh, because uh, subjectivity and grading is hard. It's hard for you, it's hard for me. The last thing I want to do is deny you points or give somebody, give one person more points than another person. And so it's helpful for me if everyone plays by the same rule book so I can compare apples to apples. Another reason that I like to have one set way of doing it, honestly, is it's just easier for me. Um, there will be significant differences in documents because there's more than one way to fix one of these problems. But the more I can have similarities, the quicker I can grade these. And these are quite time consuming to grade. And so you're helping me out when you play by the rules and do it the same way as everyone else is. And the third thing is, and it goes back to what we've already talked about, law firms have a lot of these rules. I mean, obviously, Typically, proofreading stuff isn't going to be the standardized, but um, document production rules. You just have to play by them. That's just whether you like it or not, that's the rules of the game. And so it's better to get used to it now than, than later. OK, so this is how you go about doing it. Um, if you have problems with this, come see me. Um, some students get, uh, you can actually get, the, each one is worth 20 points. There's, so there's students who routinely get more than 20 points because it is possible to get several points above that. Um, if you're a student who's struggling, typically that means you're getting, say, below 12, um, come see me. I give a lot of support in the completing the grammar proofreading assignments as well as the document assignments. I will, we will work together to make the document awesome. There is no reason for you not to do well in all of these assignments. If you watch the lectures, if you uh, do the work, you will do well. If you're still needing support, come see me. Um, if you haven't seen me and you're not doing well, you really only have yourself to blame because I provide a lot of support. Um, usually students don't come see me, um, but when a student finally does come to see me, they usually start coming every week because they see that it's really a useful investment of their time. Okay, so let's go back to home. Okay, and we're back to the cheat sheet. We've talked about the grammar proofreading assignment against every odd number. We're done with this particular module. So again, you want to, for every module, redo the assigned readings. You want to look at the key for the last uh, assignments um, in the example documents and any videos for that. By the way, I have a video for all of the grammar proofreading assignments. And after it's submitted, I show you how I would have uh, completed it. If you're doing well in the grammar proofreading assignments, you don't have to watch the video. But if you have a grade in the 12, 13, 14 range, it would probably be useful for you to watch that video because I walk through my mindset, what I'm thinking as I'm completing the assignment. You're going to want to complete the document assignment and watch the lecture. By the way, the lecture includes information beyond just how to complete the document assignment, um, and as well as these uh, assigned readings and videos, because there is a midterm and a final. It's, this course is more than just about producing documents. You need to know something about the documents and why we do it this way. And so don't think, oh, well, I know how to do the document. I didn't bother to do the readings. Well, that's probably going to result in you getting a good grade on the document assignments, but you may not do so well in the midterm and the final exam. Okay, so let's go back to home base. You will refer to this cheat sheet probably every week, uh, maybe multiple times a week, consider it a very useful resource. I wish I could star it or make the font bigger because this is a really, really useful thing. This and this are in your orientation module. The syllabus and your cheat sheet are really, really helpful documents. Here's some frequently answered questions. 
Um, so be sure to use this. I'm not going to go through these right now, but of course, if when you read them, you have any questions, uh, come see me. But you definitely want to refer to this. If you've got a question about how we do things in this course, this is probably where you want to start. Um, if it's not covered here and it's not covered in the syllabus and it's not covered in the PowerPoint, that's probably when you need to reach out to me. But if you haven't looked at these particular places, um, those are the first places you ought to go before you call me or email me because you know what I'm going to tell you? Uh, I cover that in the orientation module. Why don't you go back and look for it again? Um, that I don't like getting those emails. You don't like to get that response. Let's just avoid that entirely by you being proactive in finding the information. Here's um, information about how to find the comments, the keys, the videos, all of that stuff. You'll have access to this once the assignments are submitted. Um, in some of the modules, I actually have a, a module below it that um, explain that have the keys. Sometimes it's actually within the module. Um, uh, so it can be in either one of those places. Here's information about how to participate in the discussion board. Again, it's pretty intuitive, but sometimes people have questions about it. Let's talk about the proctoring process. And we only have two tests in this course, the midterm and the final examination. And most students, perhaps all students, are going to choose to use um, the testing center. Uh, we have three testing centers at Collin. One is on the Preston Ridge campus, the campus which is in Frisco. We have one on the Central Park uh, campus, the one in McKinney, and we also have one on the Plano campus, the Spring Creek campus. Uh, you can go to the testing centers there with your student uh, ID and take tests. The tests are computer-based, so you don't need a Scantron. You show up and you take the test. You want to check, of course, the testing center hours. They have limited hours on Fridays and Saturdays and no hours on Sundays. They won't issue a test during the last hour that they're open. Um, and you want at least an hour, honestly, to take these tests in any event, so that shouldn't be really an impediment. They're not time tests and they're not open books or open notes. Um, you do want to um, uh, give yourself uh, plenty of time to take the, these tests. Um, but I understand that uh, you may prefer to take the tests uh, from your home. And that's perfectly fine. I don't have any problems with you doing that. But you'll need to use a proctoring service. And the proctoring service we use at Colin is ProctorU. Um, there's lots of good things to say about ProctorU, but there's a few downsides. Uh, taking the tests in one of our testing centers is free to you. Your tuition is already paying for the service. ProctorU, however, is something that you'll have to pay for independently. Um, I can't tell you the cost of ProctorU exactly because it depends upon how long you take to complete the test. If you complete the test in 10 minutes, and I don't really think that's possible, it's going to be less than if you take two hours, which you probably won't take. Um, and so you kind of control exactly what that cost factor is going to be like. But it's going to cost you, you know, probably $10 to $30 per test. Not a huge amount of money, but then not a true expense either. Um, you'll also, your computer also will need to have uh, a certain uh, certain uh, technological aspects. It will have to have a, a camera, for example, on it. It will have to have a certain amount of RAM and all that kind of stuff. Um, we'll go through that if you decide you want to look into that as an option. You'll obviously need to have a place that's quiet, that there aren't other people around, that you know, if you have children, you've got the child care arranged for that. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind. Um, you certainly can use ProctorU, but keep in mind you need to let me know at least 10 days before the beginning of the testing window that you want to use ProctorU. If this is in the summer where you're taking the course, my suggestion is to let me know this first week um, so that we can definitely do the stuff that you need to do and the stuff that I need to do to make sure it makes sense for you. You don't have to during this first week, but why wait? Um, if something comes up and, and you decide the week of the test or the week before the test and we're not we're, we're in the 10 day window, you'll need to take the test in the testing center for this test. But you can of course let me know for the final examination. You don't have to take both tests of the testing center or at ProctorU, you can take one or the other. I don't have a preference, it's whatever's most convenient for you, but just keep in mind that both you and I have to uh, have several conversations and do several things to make that happen. So um, we do absolutely need at least those 10 days. 
that's the information about ProctorU. Let me go back here. Here's some information about resources and technological requirements. These are rarely issues. If you're having, if you're having some technical problem, of course, refer to this uh, website. If you uh, don't like to use Cougar Mail, you prefer your personal email, Gmail, Hotmail, whatever your account is, uh, you can actually forward your Cougar Mail to one of those resources. That's, again, completely your choice. At the bottom here of the um, orientation module, you'll see some uh, useful information that you'll use throughout the semester, um, telling you how to format things. Again, most of this information is not stuff that I have prepared, so it may not be perfect. So let's say you find this resource useful. My suggestion would be to print it up and then to mark things that are wrong about it if there are some things. Um, maybe the uh, it, it, it's perfect except it doesn't indent here. Well, print it up and make a little notation, indent here. So you'll have a, a document that you really, really can use. Um, then here's a section about calculating grades. You don't have to worry anything about this. It is my job to calculate your grade. It is your job to do the work. So um, if you're interested in calculating a grade, this helps you understand that process. Um, some instructors choose to program Canvas to uh, calculate grades for students. Sometimes I do that, sometimes I don't. The reason that I oftentimes don't is that Canvas um, lacks the a sophistication, maybe the quirkiness, I'm not sure what the right word for it is, uh, to uh, program, uh, to, to, to uh, dot every I and cross every T of how I calculate grades. And so can, if I program Canvas, it's going to be imperfect. And that's especially true in semesters that I have extra credit. And so Canvas will give you a grade, but it won't be an exact grade. I mean, it won't be wildly off, but it could be a letter grade off or even sometimes two letter grades off. Um, so I don't like to give wrong information. And I feel like when I program Canvas to give information, it ought to be accurate. And so that's why I usually choose for Canvas not to give out a grade. Um, and sometimes at the beginning of the semester, I'm not sure whether I'm giving out extra credit, so I don't know how wrong Canvas is going to be. As a result, um, you can always calculate your own grade, but if Canvas does guesstimate your grade, keep in mind that it's really just an estimate. It's probably off by at least a little, and it may be off by quite a bit more. But even if somehow or another Canvas becomes robust enough that it will calculate your grade precisely, it's still not a good idea to rely completely on it because I curve grades. And the only person who knows how the grade is curved exactly is me. And I don't know until after the final examinations are in. There is no way for Canvas to know stuff that I don't know, obviously. So even in a perfect universe where Canvas is all knowing, it isn't going to give you your grade exactly right because it can't know what the curve is going to be. Um, here, this I've kind of repeated this one. I apologize for this. Here's a little interesting article that, or a video that Chief Justice John Roberts, Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, says about writing. And here's a little story about um, late assignments. Um, I like to flag this because every now and again I'll have a student who becomes concerned. They've had some bad luck with computers or personal illnesses or something, and they get frustrated, understandably so. I mean, everybody gets frustrated when you've been working hard on something and it doesn't work out and you miss the deadline. and you, you're getting zero for something you've invested a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears in. I completely get how frustrating that is. Um, and so if when, when you find yourself in this situation and you kind of get your cool back, watch this to uh, get my explanation as to why I don't accept late assignments. It's not because I don't have a heart. It's not because I haven't been there. It's because I know that in the real world, when you're out there practicing, judges aren't going to accept late stuff. And it's much better that you go through the pain of getting a zero on something when you aren't in danger of getting fired, when you're not in danger of causing your client to lose a significant amount of money or custody of his or her child or their uh, freedom 
because you forgot a deadline or you missed a deadline. Um, it's this is the time you can afford to mess up. But that window is closing soon and pretty soon you can't afford mess ups. Most legal professionals that I know at least have missed a deadline. I missed a deadline. Um, it was early in my career during my second year of practice and it was a story that gave me nightmares for years. Um, I no longer have nightmares over it, but it was a traumatic event in my life. Didn't lose my job over it, went on and had awesome things happen with me and I stayed with the firm and everything was fine, but it could have gone a different way. I know that and I don't want you to have that experience. I can't protect you completely from it. This is the best way that I can help you. So when I say no, it's, it's a, a tough love. It's designed to help you succeed, not to cause you to fail. And I hope that you'll see in that spirit after you calm down <laughs> from having missed the deadline. Anyway, that's my spiel. I'm not going to dwell upon that anymore. Okay, so let's get started on the PowerPoint. I've already talked about a lot of these issues. Um, so let's uh, cover a little bit and then we'll get started and then we'll uh, have our next lecture in a few seconds. So this is our orientation. We've already done a lot of this, so this will be pretty quick. If I haven't said it already, welcome to this class. I love teaching this course. I consider this course, along with legal writing, to be the money-making courses here. Even more, perhaps, than legal writing, this is the course that gets you the job. You will leave this course with several beautiful documents that you can put into your portfolio that in your job interview, you pull them out, you know, when the, uh, let's say it's a family law practice and the attorney goes, have you ever uh, completed a divorce petition? You can say yes, and here's an example. And they will be floored, I promise you. Uh, not only will they afford that you have these documents and that you brought them, but they're beautiful. They're perfect. They're probably even better looking than the attorney usually presents. You're going to wow them. They may have been between you and somebody that has 10 more years of experience, but you just nailed it right then. This is the money maker. This is what gets you the job. Um, this isn't necessarily what's going to keep you employed because um, you're going to have to develop a lot more skills once you get this 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 job because you know we're not we're not clinching the deal but we are getting you to be a serious contender and so think about this course as being kind of resume and interview 101 for the, the program. Here I am, if you haven't met me before, <laughs> this is a picture of me. Uh, my name is Cynthia Groover. I've been licensed to practice law in Texas since 1990, so I'm very, very, very old. Um, I started practicing law at a large law firm in Houston called Baker Botts. It also has a branch in Dallas. And then I went in-house, which means I went to work for a corporation, JCPenney. I was there for 17 years. And I left JCPenney to come to work at Collin full-time in 2010. So I've been here for many, many years. When I was practicing, I primarily practiced labor and employment law, um, but I also acted as a litigator. I did a few, I dabbled in a few other things. Um, and so uh, I'm fairly broadly, my practice was, was on the broad side, certainly not as broad as some people's, but um, probably more broad than most. Um, I am the discipline lead, which is kind of a way of saying I'm kind of like a department chair for the legal studies, and that includes the paralegal program. I teach paralegal courses primarily, but I also teach business law to business students. I teach employment practices, which is a, an HR law course for H, future HR managers, and I also teach hospitality law, which is a business law course for hospitality majors. Um, so I'm kind of uh, doing several different things, but of course my real passion is the paralegal program. I have not had the opportunity in my career to be a paralegal, but I have been blessed to work with many, many awesome paralegals, um, some of whom chose to become attorneys, some of whom are still paralegals. Um, one of whom started out as an attorney and became a paralegal. So there's all kinds of different journeys that people take. Um, I have hired paralegals. Um, I have interviewed paralegals. I have managed paralegals. I have worked with paralegals. I have learned much from paralegals. So um, I feel like I know a lot about paralegalism. And certainly I know a lot about the law, having practiced law for all these years. Um, I'm looking forward to this semester. I hope that it will be as fun and as productive as past semesters have been. 
My office is in L232, that is on the Preston Ridge campus in Frisco. Um, and L, the L building, is the library building. And my office is on the second floor, and my office faces the quad. It's pointing toward Founders Hall. Um, so come see me. Um, in the summertime, I am, don't spend a lot of time in my office. I usually work from home more. But in the uh, long semesters, I am often in my office and would be glad to meet with you during my office hours or another time if I know to expect you. Um, I am always happy to talk with students about course materials, but also about career goals, review resumes, give some guidance about different uh, aspects of the legal profession. Check your syllabus to find out when my office hours are. I also po post my office hours on my door. Um, we have two, as I, I think I already said this, we have two textbooks for this course. One is the Aspen um, Handbook for Legal Writers. Um, we'll be using that uh, textbook if you already bought the um, Aspen Handbook. Um, I'll provide you information. Actually, let me do this right now. As I said before, we're transitioning from the Aspen Handbook to Here we go. To um, Just Writing, Grammar, Punctuation, and Stuff for Legal Writing, a book by Anne Inquist. This book is going to replace the Aspen Handbook. But again, since some students have already purchased the Aspen Handbook and another course, I don't want you to make anyone buy both versions. Uh, the reason that we decided, both Professor Wagon and I decided to replace the Aspen Handbook is that this is a more complete and more sophisticated treatment of grammar issues. It is going to be a more useful book for the legal writing course. It may be slightly less useful for this course, but overall, again, our desire is not to you to have to buy a dozen unnecessary books. So we're going with this book. This is the only book in our program to date that is actually a law school book. Um, so you'll see as you're reading it, it is written a little bit with a different audience, but I think that that's a useful thing because legal writing is really the same whether you're a paralegal or an attorney. Other, in other areas, you know, it wouldn't make sense to give you, say, a uh, tort textbook uh, that would, might be used in law school if you're a paralegal. That's not a smart uh, judgment. But um, if for legal writing, it does make sense. So this one will be a bit of a different experience. Buy this one if you don't already have this one. But if you have this one, you don't need to buy this one. Um, if you want both, you certainly can buy both. Um, but that's um, your own call. Let me go back to this one. Here we go. These other resources you absolutely should not buy. They're very, very expensive. I happen to have copies of these in my office, and if you want to come by and look at them, you're welcome to. Also, they're available on the uh, Spring Creek in the Spring Creek Library. Uh, not really for checkout, but for perusal as a reference book, you can do so. I like to think of our online classroom as really just a traditional classroom that happens to uh, uh, you know, kind of be resident in each person's um, own home or laptop or whatever device you use. Um, the lectures are essential to this class, much more important than any textbook. The lectures really are the textbook. They are not optional. You have to watch them. Um, you really, really have to watch them at least once, and honestly, more than once. But you don't always have to watch them sitting at a computer somewhere. As I say, probably the best way to do it is to do the assignment as you watch the video. But especially if it's the second time you're watching it, you can watch it while you're you know, running errands or listen to it as you're jogging or whatever uh, to maybe get the finer points. But don't consider the lectures optional you will not be successful in the course if you do, do, do something along those lines. Now, of course, one difference between an online course and a traditional course is if we're talking online and let's say I suggest you do a particular task in Microsoft Word and you're like, I don't know how to do that. You could just raise your hand and I would show the class. But that's not an option, obviously, in an online class. So that's when you're gonna have to either post a question 
visit my office hours or send me an email. I want to hear from you. I want that feedback. That is very helpful for me. And probably if you have the question, somebody else does. So really do consider this to be a traditional classroom for the most part. That's my intention. Um, this course, I struggle, struggle, struggle to organize it. There is so much on, in this course um, that there really is just no one way that's going to make sense for everyone. The, so as a result, you are going to have to explore the course, click on stuff, get a feel for how things are organized. You're probably going to say, gosh, I would have done it differently. And you might well be right. Um, but my guess is if I um, asked 20 students how they'd organize it, I'd probably get at least 10 different answers. And so um, it, this is how I'm currently organizing it. It'll probably be a little bit different next semester. Um, if you have some insights, I would love to hear them. But even if you have a great insight, I'm probably not going to be able to change the way in the middle of the semester. Um, so um, uh, the, the, the best way kind of is, is through exploring and clicking and, and seeing what's out there and re recognizing that I probably have given you the answer somewhere. You just might have to explore a bit to find it. The orientation section is so, so important in this course. Um, there's just so much material and it's not always most intuitive way it's going to be designed. There is a quiz and uh, you'll have three opportunities to take it. You can't take them on the same day, and I will take the highest grade. You need a 90 to continue in the course. It's not hard to. This is not a hard course. If you watch the video, if you look at the PowerPoints, if you uh, read the syllabus, if you review the material, you'll probably get 100. Um, but you do need, you can't wing it. You do have to review the material to be successful. If you've never taken an online course or you're new to Canvas, welcome you can absolutely be successful in this course this may be a useful website for you to visit um, gives you some information about um, online courses generally how to be successful in them and of course come see me that's another possibility um, i like to reinforce this most of the answers to your questions are sitting in your syllabus or in class announcements you can send me an email, but I'm just going to tell you it's there already for you. Um, so save yourself the delay and just look in the syllabus. Our syllabus isn't that long. You can find the answer. You can do a word search um, to find the answer. Um, the time it takes you to send the email, you probably could have found the answer if you're looking. I've taught this course a lot of semesters, and I think I've heard most of the questions people have, and I've tried to incorporate the answers. You may have a new question. I'm not saying it's impossible, and certainly ask it if you can't find it somewhere else, but I would ask that you make a good faith effort to find it. At a minimum, look at the syllabus and look at your class announcements. Also, look at your notes from this lecture. You've been taking such careful notes. Um, you may forget everything that's in the notes, so look over them before you um, uh, make a separate trip to my office hours. Um, the syllabus contains a lot of useful information. We'll be looking at that in a few minutes. Um, So another reason I didn't say this before about why I don't accept late submissions, I, I gave probably the most important reason, which is that um, courts don't accept late assignments. But the second reason is that, and this is especially important if you're taking the course over the summer, is that you, um, number one, when I grade things, I have to grade them in a group for consistency sake. So I just kind of lock myself in a room for several hours and just sit down and grade them. Um, so that, you know, the first one I grade, I'm grading the same way as the last one that I'm grading. Um, if I uh, were accepting late assignments, then I would have to wait to start the process until the last assignment was in. Well, since the next round of assignments will be due in a week, and especially over the summer, people are taking trips and things like that. So it's, it's not unusual for people to submit assignments a little bit on the early side. And so because each assignment builds on the last, you really need to see the comments before you can prepare the next assignment and get the, the best and highest grade. And so I can't show you obviously the key until everyone submitted the assignment. So um, 
it's just not possible to delay that date. I try to return assignments as quickly as I can. Sometimes I, I might even return the assignments on that Monday. Sometimes it might be Friday uh, before I do it uh, because of, of other commitments. Um, but uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get it done as quickly as possible. And if I don't have them all at one time, I'm not going to be able to do that. So that's another reason why I just can't accept late assignments. Be sure to uh, visit our course at least three times a week. That's especially true if you're taking this course over the summer. And be sure to log in by at least Tuesday. The week for our course starts Monday at 12.01 a.m. and ends at 11.59 p.m. on Sunday. So Tuesday is the second day of our course. We don't follow a Sunday through Saturday schedule. It's a Monday through Sunday schedule. You'll want to look at class announcements each time you visit. You'll see class announcements in two different places. Let me show you where you'll find them. The first place that you'll find them is right here in announcements. Uh, what I'm about to show you, you won't see this currently. This shows all of the course announcements, most of which I haven't released, but you can see the first one. Uh, welcome to Advanced Legal Documents Preparation. This gives you some information generally about the course. You'll see all the announcements that I've released um, in the announcement section. Every announcement I send out will be here, but you'll also find it in your Cougar Mail. And if you forwarded your Cougar Mail to your, you know, Gmail or whatever account, it will be there as well. Um, so you can find those in either one of those places. You'll also want to um, look at the discussion board. Um, you need to post your substantive uh, discussion board um, uh, I think it's by noon on Saturday, and you need to um, make your posts over two days. So, um, and it really is a courtesy to your other to the other students in the class to make them early. If you be the one to post on Tuesday or Wednesday, you're doing a tremendous favor to your your colleagues because everyone has to post to reply um, emails or excuse me posts. And sometimes people who are posting on Thursday look around and nobody's posted yet. So they can't do the reply post. Well, let's say they're going out of town for the weekend. They're in a pickle. They're not going to be able to complete the task um, if they don't have internet access wherever they're going. So do somebody a favor by posting early. You have to do it anyway. Might as well do it earlier. Yeah, the, the rule is, I see right here, is this your substance of your first post has to be by noon on Saturday. If you miss the deadline, you can go ahead and post, um, but you're not going to get all the credit. And again, there's no reason in the world to wait until Sunday. Um, I'm not going to count off if you wait to do your reply post on Sunday, but uh, don't put yourself in a pickle. Don't put yourself in the bind. It's just as easy to post it on Friday as it is on Sunday. Be kind to yourself and make those posts earlier. I don't, I don't make a lot of reminders about deadlines. Um, I don't do that for several reasons. The, the, the most important is uh, I'm an adult, you're an adult, I'm not gonna treat you as if you aren't an adult. Uh, you know how to calendar things. Um, let me just, let me suggest that you pause right now, get out the syllabus, let me show you where the syllabus. Let me show you where the syllabus is. The syllabus is right here. And I pull the syllabus. Go to the last couple pages of the syllabus. All the due dates are right here. You can see the due dates going forward. Put those in your day planner. Put those in whatever you use for um, calendaring purposes. I've said it to you here. And all of the deadlines are on here. You can see them as you're clipping through. Here's the deadline, here's the deadline. I'm not going to be sending out emails reminding you about things. Uh, we don't have class time, so we're not going to talk about it in class. Um, if you aren't calendaring this and paying attention, you will miss some deadlines. And that's the way the cookie crumbles. Um, this is actually quite a bit more notice than you have in the professional world. Let's say you're supposed to submit a reply brief. Well, the court isn't going to tell you, an opposing counsel isn't going to tell you, hey, wait a second, you know, you got, you got our brief, well, you, your reply brief is due in 15 days. 
you have to know what the rule is, how many days you have. You have to know whether weekends count. Um, you have to know whether you can request an extension, how you go about requesting an extension if you need it. You have to find the rule and do the count counting to make sure that it's right. So uh, this is actually quite a bit more hand-holding than you'll find in your actual practice. The other reason I don't uh, give reminder notes is that I invariably get the date wrong. <laughs> Um, uh, many times I teach seven or eight courses in a semester and it's really easy for me to get confused about due dates and so there's nothing more frustrating for a student it, than uh, a student who knows the due date is you know Tuesday and the instructor says it's due on Monday it's like well what's their real due date again you've got it on canvas you've got it in the syllabus if there's a conflict between those then yes of course bring that to my attention so I can uh, correct and adjust it but if 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 you look you'll you'll be able to see the due dates they're not a secret um, if they're consistent with each other um, then that's going to be the time that you need to submit the assignment let's look at the sample documents folder this is really important and before we do this let me just show you some text that is super important Some of the documents in the sample document folder are intentionally wrong in certain respects. Look, this is a college level course. This is not a typing course. If your sample documents were perfect and all you had to do was change the name Bob Smith to Harry Green and you just had to do a word search and cut and paste the names in it, it would be insulting to call that a college level course. Um, that's not the, the course. That's not what it's about. Yes, you will be typing. Yes, you'll be name swatching. But that's not the work of this course. The work of this course is going to happen with actual thoughts, actual consideration. Do I indent here or don't I? What's the rule? How does the rule apply in this situation? Groover said this, but I'm confronting a situation that's a little bit different. So how do I handle that? You need to sweat this. You can come to me and I will sit down and talk with you about how to get at that right answer. But don't send me an email that says, wait a second, you said this in your lecture, so what am I supposed to do? That's what makes it the college level course. I'm not going to send you an email that gives you the answer. That gives the assignment away. Most of the assignments have a few of these where you're just like, hmm, this isn't exactly what Groover talked about in the lecture. Yeah. That's the point, because when you're practicing, you're not going to be given a sample document that's perfect. You're going to have to customize it. You're going to have to make some judgment calls. That's what you're being paid for. If this were you know, automatic, obvious answers, you wouldn't be uh, performing the task of paralegal. Let me share what the document, uh, sample documents are. We're down to module 15. You'll see we have the final examination. And right below the final examination, we see the sample documents, and we have several. We won't probably be using all of these in this course, but this gives you some idea about how to do them. Let me just show you an example, a sample petition, looking at this. I can look at this and, and in just a few seconds see some errors. Um, three errors four errors, five errors, right off the board. There are going to be mistakes in your sample documents and you're going to need to fix them. So don't assume that the sample documents are perfect and if Groover said something different, she must have been teasing or something. No, the sample documents have problems. They have the doc problems on purpose. You're going to have to customize them for your particular circumstance. A common problem with sample documents is they're from a different jurisdiction. There are other states that have documents that look pretty different than the documents in Texas, but this is a Texas-based course. If you end up practicing in Illinois or Hawaii or Florida, then you're going to learn how to produce documents that look appropriate in those places. But you're not practicing there, at least you, as far as I know, you're not practicing there. And so if you get a source document from a different state, it's going to look different, but you're going to need to make it look like a Texas document. So if you see something that's different, don't think, oh, gosh, I must be supposed to do it this way. Well, no, and if you're, unless you're in Wyoming, no, you need to do it the Texas way. Exigent circumstances. 
I hope we're not hit by a tornado. I hope the zombie apocalypse doesn't happen. Um, I hope your computer doesn't crash. We've all been there. It's incredibly frustrating. But you know what? Life happens. And you need to move on. And you need to do the tasks that are assigned. That's why you complete the assignments earlier uh, than the due date. If you're having computer problems, um, you have access as a student to the computer lab at Collin. All, all three of the major campuses have computer labs. All you need is your student ID to access those labs. Um, if you want to listen to a lecture, you just need to bring uh, headphones or earbuds to listen to the lecture. They are loaded with Microsoft Word, and so you can complete all of the assignments on those computers. That's a good fallback plan if you're having computer problems. Having computer problems is not going to result in you having more time to uh, complete assignments. Please contact me if you have questions. I would be delighted to talk with you. Um, here's a little bit of information about email. Our first module in this course is the email module, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. Um, this is my email address. Please correspond with me through this address. Let me flip over here. You'll see on Canvas that there's this box called in, Inbox. I can't make this box go away. I wish I could because I don't use this tool. I'm going to explain to you why I don't use this tool, but you don't have to remember why. You just have to remember I don't use this tool. Um, in the paralegal program, most students that I have, I have for multiple courses over multiple semesters. Let's say that Bob Green is my student in Advanced Legal Documents Pro. I've known Bob several semesters, but you know what? I don't remember whether I, I had him in my intro course or not. Maybe it was contracts that I had in that semester. And even if I remember I had him in an intro course, I can't remember whether it was last semester or the semester before the semester before that. If Bob asks me a question. I need to do a little research about what I've told Bob in the past. And he's corresponded with me through the inbox. I have to remember which course during which semester he corresponded with me. And if Colin decides at some point to, to discontinue using Canvas, I'll lose all that correspondence. But if Bob instead emails me, I will get all of my emails from Bob in a central place. So I can file all the Bob Smith emails into a Bob Smith folder and can quickly find all the different things that I've said to him and that he said to me. It's a lot easier for me to handle it that way. As a result, I don't use this. I'm not going to look for it. If you send me an email here, it's like it never even happened. So don't send me an email through uh, Canvas. Um, I'm not, I'm not, don't send me through Canvas, send it to me uh, through the email system and use your Cougar Mail to send it to me. Um, I am pretty compulsive about responding to emails. Uh, many times I send it almost freakishly fast. You might think I'm stalking you or something. Um, I'm not, I promise. Um, if I don't send one to you within 24 hours, it probably means it somehow got lost in the shuffle of my emails. I apologize. It happens every now and again. Resend it to me so that I can see it because if you don't get a response within 24 hours, I probably mislaid it somewhere. Um, on a uh, there are times where I have back-to-back -back classes, so it may not be an immediate thing. Also, over the weekends, I do not typically check my emails. Um, most weekends, my family and I are out in the country. We don't have internet access uh, where we spend our time, and so therefore, from late Friday afternoon through Monday morning, um, I won't have access to, e to the internet or to email, and so therefore, I won't be responding, but I will respond on Monday to an email that, that you send to me. I'm not going to go through email etiquette because I have a whole presentation on it, but before, if you have to send me an email before that first module, please review slide seven, 16, 17, um, and 18 to uh, kind of know what the lay of the land is like uh, so that you'll uh, make the best use of your time in uh, presenting the email. I'm going to go through a few of these. Some of these are pretty obvious. If you have an issue about them, please, of course, spend more time. It's pretty rare that I have a student that doesn't uh, use good um, 
netiquette who says something inappropriate. Um, obviously, um, we don't want to use any kind of profanity, even abbreviated profanity, or to tell any salacious stories. The one time that it occasionally will come up is on the email discussion board. Uh, sometimes people will post things that are a little bit uh, racy or raunchy or questionable. Um, there's lots of things you can post, so keep it not just PG, keep it G-rated. Uh, send it, send only post things that you'd be comfortable with your grandmother or grandfather viewing or your minister, or rabbi, or religious leader viewing. Um, keep it very, very clean and, and safe so that um, nobody can be offended. Um, I would appreciate that. Here is how your grade is calculated. You can see class participation, that's just the discussion board, is 5% of your grade. The English convention assignments, which are the grammar proofreading things, are only 10% of your grade. So it's a relatively small part. We do less than 10 of these over the course of the semester. I think it might be eight. Um, so each one is a little over 1% of your grade. You can skip a whole one and it's probably not gonna change your grade. You can do poor on one or two or three, and it's not gonna change your grade. So don't get too bent out of shape about this. Your document preparation assignments is the bulk of the grade in this class. That's 50%. Uh, most modules have a document preparation, and this is where it starts really making a difference that you submit the assignments and do a pretty good job. But even here, if your first letter is not so great, but you learn from that experience how to do a great letter and you start producing great letters after that, you're fine. No worries. This can be fixed. The problem comes up when you don't learn how to do it. You keep on submitting documents with that same error. The midterm is 15% and the final exam is 20%. Both of these will require that you know how to do the document preparation and that you know the grammar and that you know something about the rules of the road with respect to the particular document styles that we use. Here is some information about the weekly assignment. I also have this in the cheat sheet section. Let me flag this. All assignments must be in .doc or .docx format. You may not PDF them. The reason that you can't PDF them is that I need to be able to see the formatting. Let me show you what I mean. When we're looking at this document, I can turn this on to see, oh, let me blow this up so you can see it better. So you, I can see all of the spacing, the, it's not doing it here, why is that not? Um, here we go, let me pick up a different document. Oh. Um, I'm not sure why it's not working right now. Uh, but um, usually you can see the tab. Let me just pull something up. So anyway. Um, The sample documents folder. Here we go. You can see every time I hit the tab button, it has this little arrow so you can clearly see the tabs. Sometimes students will do things like this. Hit the space bar lots of times. And it may look like it lines up. So if I didn't have this thing, I might think, okay, that's all lined up. But then I turn on this button, I can see, wait a second, you didn't hit the tab key here, you hit the space bar. That's a point off because the formatting isn't correct. 
formatting is important because you may want to use the same caption for the next case but if you have this formatting problem it's going to throw everything off when the name of your business here is one letter short so imagine that you can see how it causes problems in the formatting here um, and so you have to have all of the formatting behind the scenes if you PDF it I can't see the formatting and so um, you need it uh, you turn you should turn on the formatting when you're working on it another problem is that this example for example I can see that I've centered it because this button here is centered another way that I might have done this is I might have tabbed it so it's the approximate center and I can see here that I actually have a left justify and I've just tabbed as you can see here the margin is set up it looks pretty centered if I didn't have this turn I wouldn't necessarily know it's not centered but because I use the tab bar instead of the center key I'm gonna lose a point because I'm supposed to center this so that's the type of thing that I need to have the the dot or dot X so as people will submit something you know in Google Docs or um, some other program um, sometimes I can't see the formatting in those programs or and or sometimes um, I don't, can't get access to it because I don't have the underlying software for that reason I require dot doc or dot doc X you can start working on documents in a different format and then if you can translate them into dot doc or dot doc X say at the computer lab in one of the campuses that can be a way of going but you want to make sure that your final version has the extension um, dot doc or dot doc X if you have any other format I'm not going to grade it it's just as simple as that so don't uh, waste your time um, by not uh, having it in the right format and again you have access to Microsoft Word at our computer lab so you don't have to buy your own copy of this um, you certainly can if you want to but um, uh, you can use the computer labs another reason that I insist that you use dot doc and dot dot or dot dot X is that Microsoft Word is the gold standard for um, legal writing these days you need to know how to use these tools you need to be able to represent that to your uh, potential employers uh, they won't want to hire you if you don't know how to use Microsoft Word and so you need to learn and this can be a good uh, method to learn if you don't have at least a, a fairly good understanding of Microsoft Word I encourage you to um, uh, uh, take an online course of some type or at least to get a book to show you the ins and outs of using it because you will need that information to be successful as a paralegal here's some information about the English convention assign oh, by, by the way the, the the weekly assignments the document assignments are worth 30 points each they're actually uh, in total worth 50 points I use 30 points as a starting point most of the time a single error is going to result in a single point deduction Sometimes it's half a point, sometimes it's a lot more, depending upon the seriousness of the issue. The English convention assignments are worth 20 points. Um, almost always there's some extra credit. You can earn a few more points, or you can earn a lot less if you have a lot of problems. This one, everyone starts with 30 points and I make deductions. This one, every woman starts with from zero points, and when they get things right, I add points to it. So there's a kind of a different philosophical starting point for respect to those. Uh, the midterm we've already talked about, uh, the testing center and Proctor U. Go through that again. There is an ethics module. It's the final one in the course. Let me go ahead and show you where that is. We have one, as you know, in all of our courses, so there's no, no big difference here. There are a lot of legal issues relating to document production. I'm sorry, not legal issues, uh, ethical issues, legal issues as well, of course. You can see this is module 14. Um, we have an assignment, we have a discussion board, we have lots of things to read. Um, you'll definitely want to spend some time on this. Um, obviously, it's also subject to being covered on tests. And then the final examination. I talked about class participation which is 5% of your grade 
Here's some information about the discussion board. We've already talked about this, so I won't spend more time. Here are some FAQs. Um, again, you can work ahead in the course. I encourage you to do so, although you certainly don't have to. Here's some information about uh, the computer lab. I give a tremendous amount of feedback. You will be overwhelmed by feedback on your assignments. Um, I've tried to make this as logical and as streamlined a process for both you and me. Please don't make the time that I spent making the comments wasted. Use those comments, um, review those comments, incorporate those comments in your next submissions. If you don't understand them, reach out to me. Let's talk about them. It is easily possible to miss an assignment and still do very, very well in the course. I understand people get sick. I understand people have emergencies. Um, that's life, that happens. Um, don't get too bent out of shape if you miss an assignment. We already talked about doing things differently, so I'm not gonna spend any more time on that. Sometimes people worry that I did not get their assignments. Let's talk a little bit about how that works. Let's say, um, we'll do this one right here, these Module 14 Legal Ethics Essay Assignment. I have completed the assignment, I'm ready to submit it. I click on the Submit Assignment button, I go over here, I choose the file. Um, obviously this isn't the right one, but I'm, let's, let's, okay, so I pick this one. I see the name, wow, that's not the right name. So I'm going to cancel. Hit again. I'm going to choose a file. I'm going to choose this one. This is the right file. The one that I initially chose is gone. Now the one that I think is right is here. I hit submit. But gosh, is that the right file? I'm just not sure. Well, let me go check. This is what I just downloaded. I can open it up and look at it. Is that what I meant to submit? No, that's wrong. Okay, so now I'm gonna hit resubmit. Now I'm gonna find the right file. This is the one that I was supposed to submit. I hit submit. You can see that initial document is gone and now I have what I just submitted. I look at it. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Okay, we're in good shape. But then I realized, wait a second, I was supposed to submit two documents. Well, now I'm gonna add another document. Actually, I guess I have to resubmit what I already did. So this is, let's say this is the, the first document. Now I'm gonna hit the second document. I also need to submit this one. Those both look right, I hit submit. I now have two documents. I'm going to check them both to make sure they're the right version, the right documents. It's so frustrating for students. I completely get this. When you click on the wrong thing um, and then you don't get a good grade because it's not the right assignment. That's why you want to go back and click on it just to make sure it's the final version. Um, you, you want to get every point that you can. I want you to get every point that you can. If you see it here, when you click on it, it's the right thing and it ends with dot doc x or dot doc, you are in good shape. There's nothing else that you need to do to check. If something doesn't work out right here, then resubmit. But let's assume that somehow or another it's just not working. You can't figure out what's wrong, but it's not showing up here. It's not showing up here the way it ought to. Or um, then in that situation, you can email it to me. Um, again, this is why you wanted to do the assignments early so you and I can talk about it. Um, but I don't want you not to get credit if you're having a genuine technical difficulty. Uh, the deadline is still the deadline, so you need to submit it to me by that deadline. I hope that never happens. It really shouldn't because we ought to have had time to fix the problem or you had time to go to another computer or you had time to do something else. But at the end of the day, I want you to get credit for the assignment. Let's say you're able to post it, but you're still just insecure. Gosh, maybe it didn't go through. What can you do? 
What I don't want you to do is I don't, when you can see it here and you've checked it and everything looks right, I don't want you to email it to me. I get so many emails. I mean, literally some days over a hundred that I just don't need more paper. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is to email the document to yourself. Then it will be time stamped and you'll have it as an attachment and so you'll be able to prove that you had the document completed. So if somehow or another Canvas loses the document or something happens to it, you can prove to me that you actually had um, this document in its final version on a particular date before the due date. You don't have to do that. You really don't. But if it helps you sleep at night, that can be a way um, so that you'll be able to prove it. But it's certainly not a requirement. Here's some suggestions about how to be successful. Again, be familiar with the um, orientation module. You may need to revisit it as the course progresses. Follow the directions carefully on assignments and in the lectures. Ask questions when you're not sure what to do. Use the sample document. Some people have a hard time finding the sample documents. If you haven't noticed this yet, go ahead and say, or put in your notes, underneath the final examination module, which is below the module 15. Uh, calendar carefully, proofread carefully, uh, follow up and look at your due dates on a regular basis. Participate in the discussion board weekly again. Do 10 for this particular course. You don't have to do them every week if it's a long semester. When, when you see Blackboard in here, by the way, just think Canvas. Watch the lectures. I have this as number nine, but it really should be one. Um, this is the most important thing that you need to do to be successful in the course. I can't emphasize that enough. Here are some troubleshooting suggestions for how you can uh, solve some computer problems. I'm not a computer person and so this is by no means an exhaustive list of everything you may need to think about or work on. Um, obviously when you're having computer problems you're not going to be able to get into Canvas and look at this so you may want to print slide 41 or write down these suggestions, put these in your notes. These are common solutions that can help uh, get through a particular crisis. I know we'll have a great semester. I'm really looking forward to working on these documents with you. I look forward to getting to know you better. So that is our PowerPoint presentation. Now I'm going to flip on over to the syllabus because there's a few things I think are important to be aware of on the syllabus. Let's start at the first page. There's not one on the first page we need to know about, uh, but one thing is the drop date. Um, you'll want to be sure if you have to drop, uh, let's say you win the lottery or you get you uh, get a, a work transfer to you know Japan and you're just not going to be able to complete this course you'll want to drop by this date if you can't drop by this date and you want to drop later on you're going to need the agreement of the assistant associate dean um, which is rather hard to get not impossible but rather hard to get so you want to calendar this date I hope you don't need to use it but it's a good piece of data to have here are my office hours for this semester. Um, you'll see that I, I don't, my office hours that are face to face are not in my office. They usually are in my office, but not in the summertime. Uh, this summer, it's actually going to be after my contracts class that I'm offering in a face to face format on Tuesday nights. If you're in the contracts class, this is going to be super convenient. Just stick around and we can work on. Um, uh, assignments or whatever your questions are. If you aren't in the contracts class, still come to see me at 10, 10 and between 10, 10 and 11 on Tuesday nights and I'll be glad to help. I also have virtual office hours, which is through the Zoom product on Wednesdays from 2 until 3.10. The way that you access is you click on this link if you are on your, your computer, um, or you're on your iPhone or you're on your Android, you can just click on this and um, load the Zoom applications. It's super easy to do. If you're on, say, a landline, you can um, uh, call me here. If you have any difficulties with connectivity, you can email me. And there's my email again. 
Again, a little reminder, don't use the canvassing messenger tool, use my email. Um, I haven't ever had a, somebody uh, that I know of not being able to get me through Zoom. So this, this is a very easy program. We don't meet at all. There's no meeting times to be aware of. We've already talked about the textbook issue. Again, these books are not assigned. They're way too expensive for you to buy. Um, you can access them through the library or coming to my office. You will definitely need a calendaring tool. It can be a free one that you get from the place, Google Play Store, whatever, but you need this. Just do it. Pause right now and buy or get that calendaring tool. If you aren't fairly comfortable with Microsoft Word, you need an inexpensive Word guide. You can go to Half Price Books and buy one for about five, ten bucks, um, or you can check one out from the library, or you can just Google stuff. But you need to you need to know that you're going to have to do that. Again, this is the breakdown. This is the formula for calculating your grade. I said before that we're not going to that I'm probably not going to. Uh, program canvas to calculate your grade. It will have the grades, it just won't tell you uh, what the calculated grade would be. But you can calculate your own grade if you want to, and this is the formula to use. You need to get a minimum of 90 on the uh, court or orientation quiz, and you have three shots at doing so. Here are some tools if you're new to Canvas or new to online courses. Here's a, a discussion about how to a post on the discussion board. Again, it's the rule about 100 words. You need to include your word count. You need to make two reply posts. All that stuff we've already talked about. Here's some netiquette guidelines. I remind you about Microsoft Word. I don't accept anything in the other format. Don't PDF them. I don't grade late assignments, so don't do it. Generally, students do better on assignments than tests. Um, my tests are difficult, and they require a pretty sophisticated understanding of grammar. Everything that are on the tests, I cover in my lectures. Um, but you need to take careful notes and you need to review them. There's a difference between hearing someone talk about something and actually mastering the material. Um, and so keep in mind that having heard something isn't necessarily meaning that you're gonna be able to replicate that. Where I talked about Proctor U and getting with me 10 days before the window begins. Here's my email again, and there's information about Proctor U. And here is the course calendar. And you can see, because uh, it's a summer course, that we're doing two modules most weeks. And you can see, this is, a, it, let's just look at week two. There's module three that we're use, uh, doing. So there's going to be discussion board with module three. Then there's a document assignment that's due. And I give you the due date here. And there's module four. There will be a a discussion board associated with it and a document assignment associated with this. And then there's also a grammar proofreading assignment. This will be associated with module three. Again, it's an odd numbered module. So you will have three assignments you need to do this week. Some of you will be able to complete each one of these assignments in about 30 minutes. Um, that's not unrealistic. There'll be other of you who um, might spend several hours on these assignments. It really depends upon the skill sets you bring here. Um, in addition, of course, to the time that you're spending the assignments, there's lots of videos to watch. Um, so, I mean, it, it certainly won't be something that you can complete in, in an hour and a half. Um, typically, a student's gonna, gonna spend, you know, probably six-ish hours on the course a week. Um, and it's, if you're taking over the summer, it's probably gonna be more like, you know, nine or 10 hours over the course of a week um, to be successful in it. You'll see there is a grammar topic and there are lectures associated with those grammar topics. Let me show you that. I didn't actually do this before. Let's go down here to, um, you, you'll see there's actually two categories of grammar topics. Let's go to an odd number module, module seven. You can see that I have um, a lecture on business organizations. 
And then I have some information about the grammar topic. So this is the, the lecture that's going to help prepare you for the document assignment. This is what's going to help prepare you for the, for the grammar assignment. So you can see this is about subject verb agreement problems. And then, wait a second. Then here. Okay, this, this, uh, you won't actually be able to see this right now. You shouldn't be able to see this because this is the key. <laughs> um, so these won't be here. Actually, let me make that go away so we can look at this in a more intelligent way. Here we go. Da. Okay, back to this. Let's scroll down again. Okay, so we're in this module. So you can see we have the lecture about the grammar, and then we have the grammar assignment. You can see it's the same topic here. So this relates to this assignment, and this relates to this assignment. So there might sometimes be more than one lecture here or sometimes more than one lecture here. Let me uh, go here to for this one, this is a, a module nine. We've got three lectures on grammar. Uh, comma specifically, so lecture one, lecture two, lecture three, and on uh, preparing answers, we have one lecture on pleadings and then a lecture on putting this the symbol, the um, section sign. I don't know why I say symbol sign. Section sign is what that should be. So you'll see uh, two types of, or, so this is one example of a grammar topic, but there's another type of grammar topic that is in every single module, the odd modules and the even modules. And that is what is called SAT Grammar Boot Camp. These um, are very brief lectures. Let me just click on them so you can see them time up. These last about five minutes. Just click this off. Um, it says the video is out of date. And that's true because these videos are designed to teach you how to be successful in the SAT. Well, the SAT format has changed. And so uh, this particular company that produces these videos has produced new videos, which are going to be more helpful for the new SAT. But obviously, I'm not preparing you for the SAT. I'm preparing you for the grammar. And the grammar rules didn't change just because the SAT format changed. And so even though these uh, videos are out of date for the SAT, they're perfectly up to date in terms of grammar. So disregard that little warning. Um, watch these lectures. Take careful notes. And um, these lectures will be covered in the um, midterm and final examination. You really need to understand this stuff. Um, this is a, an introduction. I also have, I may not have turned these on yet, but I also have worksheets on most. I'm not going to promise everyone, but most of, of these topics. And I actually am not showing them right now, but. Um, I will turn those on. They relate to this, so I will put them underneath here. So for example, this one is about case. This is really about pronoun case. Um, and below this, you will, I will give you some ways of experimenting and working and thinking about uh, pronoun case. Um, so it'll be below the, the grammar boot camp thing. Um, they aren't assignments for grades, although you certainly can complete them. Um, and you're welcome to come to my office hours with questions but uh, you won't be submitting them. They are just designed to help you be successful in the midterm and the final examination. Plus, they will help you with the grammar proofreading assignments. Okay, so let's go back to the syllabus. You'll see I've, I have the midterm here. Um, the week of the midterm, we still have another module to cover. Um, so again, because this is a summer, we have to kind of be multitasking. Um, and then at the end, we have the final examination. 
I list it being one date, but you actually have a window to take the final examination. Okay, let's see what else. Anything else I need to point out? I provide information about the final exam and also the midterm. So this will give you a breakdown of the composition of the questions. That's for the final exam. Let me show you the one for the midterm. Oh, this is the one chapter uh, module six is a little different than the others. It's there is no document that you're creating and there's no grammar proofreading assignment that you're doing. Uh, but what you're doing is you're answering um, a multiple choice um, assignment. It's actually called a quiz because uh, Canvas calls everything quizzes. Um, but it's actually an assignment. It's open books, open notes. Um, I have given you a series of resources for, for, for looking at the information. Uh, here are the lectures and there's other resources below and um, lots of different things to consider. Um, so uh, be sure to use this. This is the hardest module in the course by far for most people. Um, so spend more time on this rather than less time. You'll see that module six is also the most important part of the course in terms of preparing for the uh, midterm. I'm not sure where I have the midterm. It's not popping out here. Might have to turn that on. To, uh, oh yeah, here we go. So it's module eight. So this gives you information about the midterm. You can, I'll just clip on this so you can see. Module six, you can see there's a total of 21 questions. There's only a total of 58 on the whole test. So module six is heavily weighted for the midterm. Uh, so you definitely want to think about and prepare and invest extra resources in module six, both for the midterm and the final examination. Before we end, let me just make sure I haven't missed something that I wanted to cover. Oh, here's some web links. I post this in all of my courses, so you've probably seen this before. Um, these aren't especially helpful for this class, but they're generally helpful. Um, good tools to figure out uh, places that you may want to go to study uh, material or even in your practice as a paralegal. Uh, so you may want to uh, note where these websites are, um, especially paralegal resources. I hope that this information has been helpful for you. I'm very excited about the semester and I look forward to spending more time with you as we make progress over the material. As always, please reach out to me if you have questions or concerns or if there's a way I can add value uh, to you as you uh, work in this course. Thank you so much for your attention. Have a great day.